WSMN now presents the Chamber Report. In the next hour, you will be updated and informed on important issues regarding the greater Nashua business community and how it affects you. Your host for the Chamber Report is Nashua native and veteran broadcaster Ed Leishas. From the broadcast booth to the State House to Washington and back, serving the greater Nashua region, Ed is a political, broadcasting, and business veteran. Ed will lead the charge in discussing news and views as well as interviewing representatives of local establishments and organizations. And now it's time for the Chamber to report to you. It's the Chamber Report on 1590 WSMN, Nashua's News and Talk, with your host, Ed Leishus. Thank you, Justin. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Chamber Report for this 26th day of September. Where did this month go? Our show today is being brought to you in part by Dartmouth Hitchcock of Nashua and by People's United Bank. October is... Breast Health Awareness Month, and as we have had uh, the last several years, uh, we have Dr. Daniel Abbas with us from Dartmouth Hitchcock. Good morning. Good morning, Ed. Welcome, welcome back. Be, welcome you back. Yeah. It's always a pleasure. You know, October's approaching when I know it's time to be here to meet with you. It's great. Well, uh, first of all, a little bit about you for folks who may have missed the uh, previous shows we've had you on. Uh, you're at Dartmouth Hitchcock, but your background uh, is what? Sure. I'm a, a radiologist who's been with Dartmouth Hitchcock going on 10 years now. Um, I, my practice is uh, general radiology, but my passion is really breast imaging. And most of my practice day to day is involved with women's imaging and breast imaging in particular. And I know when we first spoke, uh, the new facility was just uh, being uh, built. And, and since that time, you've been able to move into a, a new state of the art facility. And, and I know that in itself, forgetting the, the, uh, the successes of some of the uh, new technology and, and medicines, uh, I'm sure that's uh, made your job uh, a little easier in terms of being able to deliver to the patients. Definitely. The uh, new facility, which is off of Exit 8, um, off of the Everett here in Nashua, has been a, a real godsend to us. Um, it's really afforded us a lot of space. Um, we need space for our Breast Health and Imaging Center. And in order to really provide a comprehensive program to our patients, that new facility really facilitates that. In spite of the fact that there have been gains uh, over the years, uh, it is still a, uh, a disease that uh, strikes uh, women and men. Correct. And uh, perhaps you could share some of the more recent statistics that you may have on sure. this. Sure. You know, breast cancer by far is uh, affecting women more than men. Um, each year there's approximately 40,000 uh, cases of breast cancer diagnosed, and those are in women, with about 400 per year in men. So definitely the uh, the women are affected with breast cancer more, and there's many reasons for that, which we'll get into later on. Um, the important part for women to understand is that breast health and imaging is multifactorial. It involves yearly mammography, which we, we will elaborate on a little bit mm-hmm. later, but also uh, for women to do monthly breast self exams and have annual clinical breast exams by their healthcare providers. Now, we talk about that for women, and, and it is rare that a man will develop it, but what should men be doing, and at what age should they be thinking and, and checking? Yeah, for uh, men, relative to the risk uh, for breast cancer, we have a few patients who do have yearly mammography, actually, who are uh, male, and it's because they have a strong family history and genetic tests that were positive for certain genes. Um, that's really a very small percentage of the overall patient population that we serve. In general, men come to us because they might notice something different. They might be washing in the shower and notice a lump or a bump on their chest area and go to their primary care provider to get it checked out, and then they're referred to us for the further imaging. Um, We have had about half a dozen uh, male patients with breast cancer in the past few years. What's the goal of having routine uh, screenings, and how important are they? You know, until we had that magic vaccine, which I'm sure some genius out there is working on to prevent breast cancer, All we really can hope for is early detection of breast cancer, and that really is the goal of breast imaging, particular mammography. It's to detect breast cancers when they're small. Um, They can also be picked up by doing those monthly breast self-exams and having the yearly clinical exam, because possibly the healthcare provider might feel something that seems a little concerning to them. So in general, mammography is to detect breast cancers early, and there is really no way to prevent it. I've seen a couple of articles, and and it seems that they've gone back and forth. There was the magic age of 50 and above that women should start thinking about it. Then I saw an article a little while back that said, uh, no, perhaps a little sooner. 
Uh, what's the the rule of thumb on 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 that? Which is right, or are they both right? <laughs> it matters who you ask. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, back a couple years ago, there was a recommendation put out by the United States Preventative Task Force, which changed the recommendations for women to have uh, yearly screening mammographies beginning at age 50 and have it every year thereafter. Now, keep in mind, most of our comments today are referring to our average risk population. People who are at high risk for developing breast cancer, and many of them know who they are, um, their screening recommendations are totally different, and that preventative task force recommendation did not apply to the high-risk patients. So when the USPTF came out with this recommendation, it created a lot of confusion amongst patients. Um, since then, many of the professional colleges, such as the American College of Radiology, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as the American Cancer Society, have come out and said that they support for our average risk patients to have yearly mammography beginning at the age of 40 and to have it every year thereafter. So our standard of care in the Nashua community, which is what we are most mm -hmm. concerned with right now, is to begin yearly mammography at age 40 and have it every year thereafter. Now, if there's a history, family mm -hmm. history, uh, does it skip a generation, or do uh, those uh, children uh, and siblings, do they need to be more uh, proactive in this area, or, or, or does it skip a, skip a generation? Not necessarily. It can be uh, continuous genera generations that are affected. Um, you know, many people feel as though that they are unlikely to get breast cancer because they might not have a family history of it. The vast majority of breast cancers that I diagnose day to day are in women who have no family history. They're spontaneous breast cancers that pop up. See, all it means is that if you have a family history, you're at increased risk to get breast cancer. But the vast majority of breast cancers out there are in the average risk population pool. Um, so women who have a family history, maybe their mother or their sister, it's usually a first degree relative that we're concerned about. Um, they often have had some genetic testing done to see if they're genetically predisposed to developing breast cancer. And then they get into our radar by having more aggressive imaging and at somewhat different age and frequency. Now, would they start earlier than the 40 or 50 year old time period that we talked about? Good or question. should they? Right. Uh, the golden rule of thumb is that a woman should start screening mammography 10 years before the age of diagnosis of a first degree relative, but no earlier than age 25. So in other words, if mom was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 45, then her daughters should begin screening mammography at age 35. Interesting point. Uh, we talked about who should have a mammogram, how often, what age. Uh, can you talk to our listeners, uh, especially the younger women who perhaps might be listening and have never had one, uh, what, what can they expect? I mean, you hear, uh, you know, some horror stories about uh, it's painful to the woman, and uh, but technology is changing all that. Well, actually, uh, there are many horror stories out there, and there's probably many horror stories for every medical procedure in the books, um, mammography being no different. I will tell you that experience from the technologist's perspective is what really matters most. And also something that the, the uh, patient can do is to try to schedule their mammogram during a uh, quieter time in her menstrual cycle, usually days 7 through 15. That's when there's least hormonal influence on the breasts, and that's when the woman might be able to really tolerate the exam a little bit better. In general, the pressure, which is really what the bad press comes from, <laughs> it's, it's very short. It's immediately released upon acquisition of the image, so it's literally just for a few seconds. Um, I've had many patients that I see day to day that have gone for their first mammogram who then see me in follow-up and say that it was not nearly as bad as they had thought or that they had heard. And again, uh, it's, it's for their benefit to have this done. So the patient comes in, they have the mammography uh, imaging done. Uh, what happens next? Right. Uh, well, a routine screening mammography exam is usually around 20 to 30 minutes, with the actual acquisition of the images taking just a couple moments, probably less than five minutes total. We tend to do two views per breast. Um, the woman will be compressed somewhat side to side and somewhat head to toe for each breast. Um, we now have, and we'll talk about this later on, this wonderful new technology of three-dimensional tomosynthesis mammography. And really, from the patient's perspective, it's the same, whether it's a traditional two-dimensional or a three-dimensional mammogram. They still have to have compression. It's still very short duration of compression. And that compression serves a vital role. That allows us to minimize patient motion and allows us to decrease the amount of radiation that the patient gets because the thinner that the breast is compressed, 
the less radiation that is needed to get through that tissue. So it really serves two major factors in improving the patient's experience and allowing us to pick up small cancers. Um, the vast majority of women who go for their screening mammogram will get a letter in the mail that says everything looks wonderful, you're good to go for a year. That's the vast majority. Every now and then you get women who we refer to it as being called back. They're asked to return for additional imaging. That might involve a breast ultrasound as well as additional mammography views to further characterize something that we saw in those screen mammography images so that we can get further detail and characterize what it is that might be going on in their breast. And as good as the new uh, equipment is and, and the individuals who are reading those, those pictures, uh, there occasionally are what is known as false positives. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons for the, the callback, to ensure that it is nothing. And, 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 but I know that a patient getting that type of a call to come back, immediately they're going to start thinking the worst. Unfortunately, that is correct. Um, most women, when they're asked to return for additional imaging, are very concerned about having breast cancer. And my experience has been the vast majority of those women who are asked to return don't even need a biopsy. They don't have breast cancer. It was a false positive, like you referred to. Um, in an effort to minimize the false positives, as well as in an effort to decrease the number of women who have to come back for additional imaging, um, what recently came around is this three-dimensional tomosynthesis mammography, which I'd like to talk about a little bit, because this really is geared to decrease those false positives, as well as decrease the need for returning for further imaging. Um, this mammographic technique allows us to see through the breasts in very small one millimeter increments. And as I referred to earlier from the patient experience during the mammography exam, it's the same whether it's a 3D or a 2D. Uh, same amount of compression and really the same duration of compression. However, what we see as radiologists and breast imagers is much greater detail of the breast. And by allowing us to see through different levels of the breast, we're able to decrease the chance of having um, superimposed shadows. Superimposed shadows are a common reason why women get asked to return for additional mammographic images. Because we're able to go through the breast layer by layer by layer, we're able to see much smaller, thinner detail on the original screening exam, and therefore most patients don't have to come back. Our own experience at Dartmouth Hitchcock in Nashua has been wonderful. We used to have around a 10 to a 12 percent callback rate. That means out of every 100 women who came in for their mammogram, between 10 and 12 were asked to return for additional mammography. That 10 to 12 percent has now decreased to 4 percent. Wow. October is Breast Health, Health Awareness Month, and we're talking to Dr. Daniel Abbas from Dartmouth-Hitchcock here in Nashua. You're listening to The Chamber Report on 1590 WSMN, Nashua's News and Talk.